do Bible study, yeah! Uh, welcome to the Kingdom Project Podcast. I am your host, Marcus Hall, and we are going to pick up where we left off in Colossians chapter 2. We ended at verse 12. All right, so let's just get our, our footing here. Uh, Paul has been addressing the philosophies, the empty deceit, the traditions of men, part of the things that had to do with Gnosticism and even Judaism, mixing of the law, mixing of the gospel, and him showing the completeness of Jesus and our connection with Jesus shows that other philosophies and traditions are unnecessary and that the work of Jesus uh, in his people through the spiritual circumcision um, and illustrated by baptism is what really counts all right so that's where we left off so we are in then 13 um, and we're going to try to just knock this out for the in this chapter i think we can hopefully we will there's uh 13 to 23 so let's see 13 in you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh god made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands this he set aside nailing it to the cross he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him all right so and you being dead this is the place we've all been everyone is here everyone uh has experienced this and has been spiritually dead before they are raised raised sorry before they are raised with him through faith in the working of God in Christ through faith by grace <laughs> all right before we have new life we are spiritually dead and before before a person comes to new life um he he's has trespasses He's dead in his sins and all those things, right? But we are just not only made alive, but we are made alive together with Christ. We are placed in him. This is union. We've, take, we've taken, um, taken the old self has been put on the cross, died with Christ, uh, buried, and resurrected to new life, all right? So uh, we, were, we were spiritually dead, dead in our trespasses, in this uncircumcision of the flesh, uh, before our life, our new life, being raised to life in Jesus, we are dead in those things. A trespass is uh, an overstepping a boundary. And we're dead because we overstep God's boundaries in our sin and our rebellion, even the rejection of him maybe, if that has occurred. But uh, through faith, we are saved, we are placed in Christ, we are made new creations, and we are made alive together with him. Like, it's not us that can make ourselves alive. It's only God through Christ who can do this and make us alive with Jesus. We can never be made alive apart from him. This new birth then and this cleansing go, go together as features of the new covenant and um, is part of the, the gospel of Jesus of new covenant believers it was also pro prophesied in the old testament in ezekiel 36 25 through 27 now um having forgiven us uh having forgiven us all our trespasses in 13 in the greek it's grace so we are forgiven by grace and then he says that uh, he's canceled the record of debt. Um, some translations says having wiped out the handwritten hand or handwriting of requirements that was against us. All right, this all has a, a mo has in a sense a list of sins, a list of crimes, or a moral debt, um, a, a debt that no imperfect person or just a man could comp could pay, but it can only be taken out of the way by payment from the perfect sacrifice jesus christ all right now this whole thing in general um is understood in a couple of ways some take it in a legal sense say it represents the charges against a prisoner or a confession by uh, or a confession of wrong made by a prisoner 
Others see that it's a financial sense and that it's a debit or a ledger sheet that shows that one is bankrupt before the Lord. Either way, though, it doesn't matter because it means that that actual document that once condemned us is now taking, uh, t- taken from us. It's taken out of the way and it's been nailed to the cross. That's, you know, literally it's been wiped out. The Greek here is a compound of uh, the uh, of the word to anoint and a prefix that means completely. So the ideal is that something was completely wiped over or wiped out. All right. Uh, that means we uh, anything, any accusation, any any debt or whatever against us were completely completely wiped away and replaced and made new. And it says here that. Jesus then nailed this to the cross. He not only uh, suffered and, and was crucified and died, and not only acted as the high priest and the, uh, the Passover lamb, but uh, he, he, he took what he paid for. He, he paid for that writing that was against us. He took it out of the way. He wiped it totally clear, nailed it to the cross. Everything that needed to be done to make this possible um, that was against us accusations and uh, all of that could no longer accuse us now because of this all right so and and because of this he has disarmed principalities and powers all right so now pause for one moment if you've recently listened to the episode principalities and powers I've discussed how most of the time it's not uh, demons and all that here is one uh, one place where like the fifth definition is actually being used. Um, it's those same words, uh, but here it is. In, in, in some translations, it, it says um, rulers and authorities. Others, it says principalities and powers. Now, it, it still doesn't matter because um, we're, we're going to see it in both ways here. All right, so... But Paul, it seems to be that Paul here is using um, the spiritual influence that uh, influenced the great, greatest powers at that time. Okay, so whether it is a, uh, a hostile uh, demonic being, the point here is that he's disarmed them. They do not have the same weapons to use against Christians any longer. Now, at that time, in the first century, we have Rome, all right, the greatest in power, and Judaism, the greatest in religious power, who come to conspire together to put the Son of God on the cross, right? So Paul Paul shows us then here, though, the paradox of the cross, if you will, that the victorious Jesus took the spiritual powers animating these, uh, these groups and stripped them, held them up to contempt, and publicly humiliated or triumphed over them. So in either case, if it is the, the, the government, commercial, religious systems, or demonic entities, he triumphed over them. He, uh, he beat them. <laughs> He's victorious over them. Um, and so disarming principalities and powers or rulers and authorities, though, still has what I said, has the meaning of that they have no weapons to use against the believer any longer. Um, the only thing that they can use is deceit or fear or a vain imagination. All right. And these are the only effective uh, weapons, if you will. But I put that in quotations that are not tangible weapons at all, though, but demonic influences or spirits only have power um, when we fall into the deception and believe in it. Other than that, it's the influence of the influence of the entity of sin that is governed within a person and the knowledge of good and evil. Um, and that's how they run their life, their business, their political powers, their religious systems, and etc. Nevertheless, Jesus triumphed over them and Paul uses the similar language in 2 Corinthians 2:14 um, that that but thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere what he had in mind 
Paul did here is the Roman victory parade where a conquering general would led his defeated captives through the streets to parade them around um, and, and, and to um, uh, show his triumph, all right? Um, uh, so H hell's imagined victory over killing Jesus was turned into a defeat that disarmed every spiritual enemy who fights against those living under the truth, under the light, under the redemption of uh, the cross and the resurrection of new life. All right. Jesus made a public spectacle of defeated demonic spirits and those of hum uh, human uh, uh, influence as well. And by doing this, he makes their defeat all the more humiliating. All right. So Christ is the victor. Now we go into 16 and 17, and this is applying the truth of Jesus' victory in light of the Colossian heresy that's at hand. So, therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. There's many of you listening, I know you would say together with me amen <laughs> oh, so many things go on these days so many a mixture of law and gospel a mixture of saying in the old covenant looking at types and shadows the hebrews movement all of the, that type of stuff the 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 sabbath what it naturally w was originally from from friday evening to saturday evening to eating certain things and fasting and diets and daniel fast and all these things uh the new moons uh the festivals uh blowing shofars and all that type of thing uh things that happen all right we w many of us know this occurs it happens it's out there <laughs> so the opening here is uh, so or therefore but so, and it's important because it connects this thought with the previous thought, all right? Because Jesus won such a, a glorious vic victory through his death and resurrection, we are to let no one judge us in our food or in drink or in other matters that are related to legalism. That's the thing here. A life that is centered on Jesus and Jesus alone and what he has done has no place for legalism. Food, drinks, festivals, new moons, Sabbaths, all of those things were a shadow of what was to come. The Old Testament law had certain provisions that are now done away with in Jesus. All right regarding such things as food and the sabbath or sabbaths it says but it isn't it isn't that these things were bad they were simply a shadow of things to come once the substance has come we don't need to live in a shadow anymore jesus obviously is the substance he's the fulfill fulfillment types and shadows are a biblical thing it is real they're a real person a historical event um, uh, uh, um, all that, uh, you know, it's a material, then it graduates to the spiritual within the anti-type, the spiritual substance that's much better, much greater, and is the fulfillment of the type and shadow. Paul here is saying, these things are shadows. You're living in shadows. Don't have anyone judge you over these matters. All right. Days and foods as observed under the Mosaic law are not binding upon new covenant believers. The shadow has passed. The reality has come. So for the Christian, all fo foods are pure. All days belong to, to God. So we are, there, we are free to keep any type of diet that you would like or to observe the Sabbath if you want to. There's nothing wrong with those. However, the point here is, you know, those who do that cannot think that eating in a certain way or the observance of the right Sabbath makes them any closer to God or more spiritual than others. And therefore they could not judge another brother or sister who does not observe such laws. All right. It's legalism. It's Judaism. It's regulations. It's done away with. Now, Paul goes in 18 and 19 to rebuke, uh, rebukes the strange mysticism 
of the actual Colossian heresy that's going on there. He says, let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not, and not holding fast to the head, which is Jesus, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. So, here he's saying there's these people that take delight in this false humility and they are worshiping angels. All right. These, these aspects here were parts of the false teaching that was going on here as part of the Colossian heresy. That's why Paul touches back on these themes throughout this letter. And the antidote here for, for both of these false te teachings is simply this more of Jesus, more of the truth, more exalting Jesus above angels and realizing that because of his finished work, there is nothing to take pride in. Um, nobody else to be worshipped, no false humility. Um, th those things don't make anyone more spiritual. Instead, it's holding fast to the head, which is G Jesus that makes us truly spiritual and makes us all united in the Holy Spirit. And then he, he talks about the puffed up, the vainly uh, puffed up and uh, um, the, uh, the sensuous mind and, 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 and things like that. But puffed up without reason, right? It, this is arrogance. This is uh, describing spiritual ar ar arrogance of the false teachers and those who believed what they taught. There are a few things that can be um, should not be mixed together, all right. Especially in a believer, and that would be spiritual pride and arrogance. Those two are, is a dangerous mix that is going to explode or implode on that person at some point, and it will all come tumbling down. Then, from whom all the body, from whom all the body is what he was saying, or or um, I lose my place. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments. All right. They're holding fast to Christ. He's the head. All right. So when these strange uh, teachings or even mystical movements arise in the church, they do not appeal to the whole body, but only usually it seems like only to a few elite type of Christians. But this is not the cause under the head of, of Jesus because he wants all the body to grow together, to be knit and nourished in the same manner. So, and because of that, the result of that then is that it grows with an increase that comes from God. This is God's plan for church growth. We remain faithful, connected to Jesus, our head. God gives the increase. Then, then Paul just sort of goes back again to rebuking the whole essence of legalism in 20 through 23. If with Christ you die to the elemental spirits of the world, world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. And then in parentheses it says, referring to things that all perish as they are used. According to human precepts and teachings, these have indeed an, an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. All right, so do not, do not. Uh, it's a perfect description of legalism or a legalistic religion. Do not do this, do not do that. Why? All right, defined more by what we don't do rather than by what we do. Christianity is a moral religion. However, it has a clear moral boundary or boundaries, but its foundation at its foundation is positive action. All right. And that, that Jesus, uh, it's the law of love. You, you died with Christ from these elementary, uh, principles or what he says, here, these elemental spirits of the world. Now, another translation says, from the basic principles of the world. And remembering this is a key to living above legalism, that our identification is with Jesus. It's in Christ, in his death, in his resurrection. That becomes the foundation for our life in him instead of our law keeping. 
And um, so one aspect of legalism is that this the doctrines of men. The doctrines of men are promoted as the laws of God, which is something that is, you know, is not acceptable. Uh, and and he he said he says uh, what that's what he means when he says according to human precepts and teachings, and that all these things have an appearance of wisdom in promoting self made religion and 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 all of this stuff, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. So we might regard this as this one of the greatest indictments against legalism in the word that these things indeed have an appearance of wisdom but there are no value at all at the bottom the bottom line here is that legalism's rules have no value in rest, in restraining the indulgence of the flesh if you will it, it doesn't do it it doesn't kill the flesh um, it's not transforming the mind. It's not renewing the mind. What it's doing is just um, sin modification, if you will. It's uh, behavior modification. It, instead of l s realizing that the root of the problem and the identification has been removed and been uh, uh, crucified with Christ, and you've been born again and made new, what it does is just put mod modifiers in the brain to make you follow this rule, that rule, the other, and it becomes legalism. That's that's what he's going at here. It has no no value. Those things have no power over the indulgence of the flesh. What does, though, is the Holy Spirit in you that empowers you to no longer submit to sin, to be able to overcome sin, and to be able to triumph over those things, just as Christ has triumphed over sin death and the devil himself all right so this is a self-imposed religion then is is man reaching to god trying to justify himself by keeping a list of rules but Christi christianity is god reaching down the man in love through christ restoring favor reconciling him them and bringing them in to christ making them new righteous holy and blameless all right we did it drive through style that's <laughs> we finished colossians chapter two and we'll be back at some point with chapter three to take a look at that as well all right there's another episode if you have any questions uh comments disagreements whatever send them my way the kingdom project podcast at gmail.com check us out on facebook join the discussion page and as always, be a mustard seed, be leaven. Thanks for listening.